Hello everybody. Hopefully the audio is working. Checking for the audio. And hopefully there is a little bit of music. Maybe there isn't music. Where is the music and is it playing? Music should be playing, yes. Okay, I think that's all the technology tech's done. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a millinery studio live stream. My name is Ilona, I'm a milliner in, based in London. Oh dear, I've messed up that first line, haven't I? And I'm not filming this not live, so I can't re-record. Anyway, hello everybody. <laughs> How is everyone today? I am enjoying the sunshine because summer is apparently here in London. So I've dressed up in my best spring gear for the stream. Um, I've got a couple of things to preview for you guys, as usual. When you join me on a stream, I like to show you what I've been working on in the week. <laughs> so I guess, um, shall we start looking at some things I've been working on? And then we'll actually get on to the meaty bit of the stream. Um, if any of you follow me on Instagram, at Bylona Millinery, you will have seen that I've been posting pictures of these headbands. So I've got a pink one a black one, black and orange, and then I've also got the blue flower that we completed in um, one of the previous live streams. This one isn't on the headband because the one on the headband has been on my mum's head this weekend. She wore it to, um, to a party she went to, so hopefully she enjoyed it. She looked lovely in it, so um, this is just a second flower that I made just to have some copies of them. Should we have a look at them close up? Let's see, if I switch camera views. Here we go. Look at this, this is the pink version. Oh, let's refocus that. Here's the pink version. So, whoops, there we go. That's still not focused, is it? There we go. Here's the pink version. So I used slightly different fabrics in these ones. So if you remember from the last stream, I had a few problems with um, tooling the cotton petals of the flower because cotton is um, less able to resist the heat from the flower tool. So it got slightly burnt in a few places and I had to redo the flower. Um, just so that it didn't have any burnt edges. But in this one, I've not used cotton. This is pretty much all silk with silk velvet. So we've got a layer of silk organza. Then I've got a layer of silk velvet. So, so far the same as the other hat. Then the back of the velvet, because you need to back the velvet to um, give it some stability, is actually backed in an acetate lining fabric. Um, normally I wouldn't have used the acetate because, again, the acetate, um, it's a man-made fibre, it also kind of melts um, under the hot flower tool, so I had to be very careful with it. But the reason I used the acetate is because I had a whole book of samples of acetate linings, and I just wanted to use up the duplicate samples that I had because I had two sample books with slightly different overlaps, so I wanted to use this pink on the back of that flower petal to use it up so that I didn't feel like I was wasting it. Um, then after that I have a layer of um, another sample fabric. Oh no, this one's white. White Dupion. That's not a sample fabric, just standard white Dupion. And then this is a different um, fabric. This is a silk satin backed crepe or crepe back satin. So we've got some... The, I, I chose to put the shiny satin side on the other underside because I just I didn't want that shininess coming through and interfering with the shininess of the velvet. And then the second layer of petals, it's the same all the way through, but slightly different pinks, just to see how the different tonalities would play. I think that's turned out pretty well. And um, apologies for the plaster on my finger. I know it's unsightly, but um, I was doing some drunken sewing yesterday and I stabbed myself. So um, yes, better plaster than ruining the fabrics. <laughs> This is the orange and black. So again, I've got the silk organza, uh, silk ve velvet, but this time it's backed in silk organza. Um, I just, I wanted to see what it would look like with it being slightly kind of smoky looking. So instead of a black or an orange to completely cover the back of the velvet, the organza, the black organza lets the 
orange of the velvet come through a bit and so it looks a bit smoky. Um, so just a few more tonalities in there. And then an orange silk dupion and a black silk dupion and the same repeated again. And then it's on a headband that I made myself, which is a wireframe covered in buckram, um, then covered in bias dupion. And on the underside, it's got a Petersham ribbon with my label on the inside. And it's all stitched invisibly, so you can't see any of the stitching there. There we go. So that's one thing I've been working on finishing for the summer season. Another thing I've been working on, and this video is coming soon, and I've learnt my lesson to not uh, give video deadlines to you guys because sometimes things go wrong and I can't release a video when I want to. Um, so there is a video coming on this next hat that you'll see, but I don't know when it's coming. But um, that hat, here it is. Hopefully you can see it there from the other side. So, oh, bent my head too far back. I'm still trying to figure out what the best way to fix it to my head is, but um, this is, um, it's called an infinity hat because it looks like the infinity symbol. And you might recognize it from the television show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I think the current new season is coming out now uh, with various episodes. But this hat is from the first season when um, the main character, uh, Mrs. Midge Maisel, goes to her um, summer resort in the Catskills in America. So, um, and this is actually quite a standard design for the 1950s. I think the costume designer for the show did such a good job at finding vintage costume pieces. And if you're looking for something to watch that's really really fun and also exceptionally stylish I do recommend you watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel because it, not only is the storyline fun but the fashion is so fun the fashion is amazing in it um, so there will be a video coming on this kind of hat and how to make it I don't know if this is exactly how they made the hat for the show because, and I don't know if the hat in the show was a genuine vintage piece or um, if someone was commissioned to make it but this is how I would make an infinity hat from um, various techniques that I've picked up here and there and actually I'm, I'm already seeing one problem with a few design choices I've made uh, let's switch camera views and have a quick chat about that um, even though I will talk about this in the main video now I think as well but some initial observations from wearing this hat for the past 10 minutes I chose to put the clips in the back thinking that it would anchor it kind of forwards and then when I put it on my head I actually have now decided that it looks better on my kind of head shape it looks better further back on my head so I think I need to reposition the clips to make this um, the front or actually because it doesn't really have a front and back. What if I just rotated it? Yeah, there we go I don't need to stitch it again because it doesn't have a front and back. Let's see if this works better. I Always complicate things and think oh, maybe I should restitch it, but no in this kind of instance. There we go. Look at that That works. Okay. Yes, and so now what the combs are doing is they're anchoring in my hair and um, it's 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 combing backwards rather than combing forwards. So here's a tip for when you're thinking about where to position a comb inside your hat. If you want the hat to sit forwards on the face, so like if I wanted the hat to be here, I would put the hats in the back because they're going to push the hat forward. But if I'm having a hat that sits kind of further down the back, I want to put the comb at the front so that it can grab onto my hair and not fall off my head going backwards. Um, you can also obviously put the combs in at the sides. So if I had a hat that was sitting here, so kind of like three quarters on my head, you know, like a nice, um, like a nice percher, or some people like to wear their pillboxes to one side. In those hats, I would be putting the comb kind of in the back third, the back quarter. So if this is my hat where my hand is, then this other hat, this other hand, the comb would be somewhere over here to hold it, um, pushing it forwards onto my face and 
kind of across my head to the side. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so that's what I've been working on. Um, I've also been working on updating my um, technology knowledge, always striving to improve what I do on the technology side of things because um, I don't know if any of you guys know this, I actually have a background in graphic communication design. That's what my degree is in. And so I've always had a love for um, photo manipulation and um, using graphics to kind of enhance visuals of things and um, making videos kind of goes into that and I think I, th I think I've kind of reached the level where I want to be at with videos because if I try and push it a bit more I'm going to overcomplicate things and I'm not going to know what I'm doing and it's going to look a bit messy um, but I really needed to work on updating some of my um, photoshopping skills because I was using a very old Photoshop version that I got back when I was a student and since then it's obviously been updated several times and I wasn't working on the newest version and Photoshop have a funny subscription service where you subscribe to the program on a monthly basis rather than just being able to buy the whole suite and that was prohibitively expensive for me and I couldn't do it. So I've been learning a different program that's much cheaper than Photoshop but does the same things. So my brain has been overloaded um, and essentially, long story short, although this has been a very long story already, I needed to take a day off today and that's what I did up until about 12 o'clock midday and at 12 o'clock 12 o'clock midday I thought no I'm bored now, I, I can't take another day off, uh, well I can't take the rest of the day off because I'm bored and I've run out of things to do and there's a few little personal hat projects that I've been working on, so nothing for any clients or anything, um, just something for myself and for my husband that I've been meaning to get done. And so that's what this stream is going to be about. Um, I'm going to be doing a few things that I don't know what I'm doing, as usual, and testing out a few, uh, testing out one new material that I've got my hands on. Um, so I guess after all that conversation. <laughs> Uh, I should probably get started. <laughs> um, what should I do first? Let's see. So three things I want to get done today. Three things. Uh, firstly, I... Oh look, a lot of yellow today. All the yellow. Um, this is a Bias Cinema Brim, which will also be making an appearance in a video. Um, but that video has been filmed. This is just a personal project for me because I wanted this hat in yellow to match this dress because I think it would look really nice. This is how this bias cinema brim would sit and it would have a thing in the middle of it as well where right now you can see my hair. But I need to stitch it because currently it's being held together with two um, clothes pegs. So that's not obviously... Um, I mean it, it could be a fun look. <laughs> with the paper clips, actually the angles of that is quite fun, but I do need to stitch it down and I need to do some invisible stitching through uh, eight layers of cinema. So I thought that would be a nice thing to show you guys, just go very slowly in real time how I would stitch the cinema. So there's that. Um, then I've also managed to get my hands on some vintage blocking net. Look at this. It's not quite like the modern kind of blocking net that we use and it's also very fine and it also rips very easily. But I managed to get my hands on this at a hat block sale that, um, oh, hello Drusilla. <laughs> I managed to get my hands on this blocking net when I went to a um, hat block sale from John Boyd Hats and that was, oh, Drusilla's just gonna boop the microphone. Please don't do that, girly. Uh-oh, uh oh uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> So yes, the blocking net I got at this um, hat block sale and that was really lovely to go to that hat block sale because I managed to um, say hello to some of my subscribers. So if you were there at the hat block sale from John Boyd Hats and you met me and you said hello, I would love to put some faces, uh, some names to your faces because um, I didn't get to chat to you guys for too long, so if you were there, let me know in the chat or in the comments below if you're watching this on playback. Um, say hello, yes. <laughs> so that was fun. So we'll test this out. Um, and I've got everything around me to try and block a kind of uh, a turban shape with it. 
And then the other thing that I really probably should get done, and this is the priority for today, because my wonderful husband, who helps out behind the scenes on all these videos, he is also into his hats. I don't make hats for him because I think millinery, well, hatting for men is a, or, or men's styles even, um, is a very different skill to lady styles. And I just, I don't have the equipment. I don't have the kind of tools, but what I can do is change a ribbon on a man's hat. And my husband treated himself to this new hat. I'll show you what he got himself. Uh, this is a kind of fedora, a floppy brim fedora shape. This is from Laird and Co Hatters in London. And they're very lovely people in the shop. They helped him pick the right size and they stretched it out a bit for him because he was kind of in between the two sizes. Um, and I really like everything about this hat except for the um, ribbon band. I think um, my husband, he's a... He's a man with some flair. A black hat band just it doesn't really do it for him. He needs something a bit extra on the hat. And so what I went, I, I went and bought some ribbons for him to see what would look nice on the hat. Um, and I thought it would be really fun to try and give him a hat band that has several colours in it. And I was really hoping to get my hands on some um, uh, stripy Petersham ribbon. But in the shop I went to, they didn't have any like fun colours in the stripy Petersham ribbon. So I thought I'd get a black ribbon and a blue ribbon and then I can curve them and stitch them together. Maybe give it like a big stripe at the top and a small stripe at the bottom or put it in the middle. I don't know. Um, we have options. And in fact, we can do a poll on that later. And um, actually, my husband, who is... Uh, the moderator for the chat can tell me in the chat later on um, what option he would prefer. So that's fun, we can do that. Oh, and I also got another ribbon. This is this is a very nice option, but it's not Petersham. And um, ideally this would have been a Petersham ribbon, but it's not. This is a nylon ribbon. It's a nylon grow grain, so it's got this, a similar texture. And it's made in a similar way, but it's, it's nylon, so it's not going to have that curving capability that a Petersham ribbon has and I like the colours on it, I like the size on it, I like the pattern on it and I want to make that into a hat band for his hat as well and so because we've got these two options I also wanted to see if I could do a um, detachable hat band so that he could kind of pop it on his hat and wear it one way one day and then come home and the next day take off one hat band and put the other one on so I don't know if that's going to be possible because ideally I would tack it down with stitches or maybe it can be seasonal, maybe um, in the spring it could be green and then in the winter it could be blue because he's got a nice blue um, winter coat. But we'll see, um, we'll see when we get to it. But I thought we should start with the blocking net because if I block it now it might dry by the end of the stream and we can take it off the block and see. Um, but I'm very nervous about this blocking net because I tried stretching it a bit earlier and it was very fragile. It just ripped. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Where is it? Here's, here's the bit I ripped. Look at that. You can see on top of the block there. This is, I was just trying to stretch it this way to see where the stretch is in this, in this one and it ripped. So I'm very worried. This isn't like the type of blocking net that... Um, a type, this isn't like the modern blocking net. I've got some here. If you don't know what blocking net is, it's like a turban foundation material and I have a video on it, which I will um, link to. And if you're watching this on a playback, I will link to it in the top right. Um, otherwise, maybe Matthew can find it in the chat. There's two videos um, on blocking net that I have. It's one about bias pleats. I talk about the turban base in that one. And also I tried making my own blocking net which was an interesting experience. But this is what blocking net looks like. It's like a fish net. It's made out of cotton. It's covered in a starchy paste and it has stretch in all the ways because this is knitted. Um, I, it looks woven, but it's knitted and that's what makes it really special. And it's quite a nice stiff shape, but it's still pliable and it holds a turban foundation really well. So if you wanted to drape some fabric over this, it will hold the fabric, but it won't be rock solid like maybe a buckram foundation would be. 
So it's nice to have those options. But you can't buy this anymore because all the machines that used to make it were decommissioned and now no one's making it. So that's a shame. So we've got to find other alternatives. The alternatives being finding your own cotton net and starching it. Um, this was one of my experiments. As you can see, it's really not as stiff as the modern made black version. It, it just dents everywhere. So I don't think it would support as much fabric as the other one could. Maybe I could like stiffen this over the top again um, and try again. And really what the problem here was is that look at how fine this blocking net is. I stiffened it with a starchy paste and the problem with that is that starch needs some fibers to latch onto and kind of burrow its way in and then it expands and that's how it stiffens and because there's just not enough cotton fibers in here compared to the um, modern blocking net there's there's just no way it can hold all this starch that's needed to get this. So it's not about level of stiffness, it's about amount of stiffener that's been applied to these fabrics, and that's where the problem comes in. Um, but this blocking net, which is a vintage one, now I hypothesize that it is from the 80s, just by looking at it. Uh, it, it could be earlier, I think it could maybe be like from the 50s, to about the 80s, and because it's so fine, um, this one has a hexagonal pattern, so it actually looks a little more like um, cotton bobbinet. If you're into your corset making, you know what that is. It's it's like a non-stretch cotton fabric, I think. Or well, uh, or is it stretchy? Or it's supposed to not be stretchy for corsets, but actually, I have some cotton bobbinet in my cupboard, and it does kind of stretch. And I thought that could be used for the turban foundations, but I didn't want to waste it because I ordered it and I thought, oh, it's such a nice material, actually, I want to make a corset out of it rather than a turban, so I didn't end up experimenting on it. <laughs> um, so I guess this is the only option right now. Um, let's see if I can count how many strands this is. This does not feel like cotton to me, but it definitely feels sticky. So there's some kind of stiffening agent in here already. I think this is nylon. I think it's nylon, and if I stretch it, so it stretches that way, so let's say with the grain, even though there isn't a grain, so uh, I guess parallel to the cutting line. Let's go that way. Oh, you see it ripped. There, it ripped. I can get my nail through that. So, okay, so stretching it parallel to the cutting line is a bad idea. Let's go a bit further along and stretch it um, perpendicular. Oh, no, you see, ripped that bit off as well. Because with the cotton, with the modern cotton blocking net, it was possible to really stretch it and it wouldn't rip, I think. Or at least I don't remember ripping it. Maybe it can rip. Uh, let's try on the diagonal, so on the bias. Oh, no, also rips. Okay, this is just a very delicate blocking net. Um, let me clear some space on my table. That was a thread falling on the floor. <laughs> okay, I now have space on my table to block. Um, I need to cover this in cling film first. Always cover your blocks in cling film to protect them. Oh, I can feel all that si sticky stuff from the blocking net on my fingers. <laughs> There's loads of people in the chat today. Welcome everybody. I know I haven't been keeping up with the chat messages as well as usual. I've been focused on trying to get things done. Or rather I haven't, I've just been chatting away. 
but I was just, I've had such an exciting week. I wanted to tell everyone about all the exciting new programs I was learning about. But um, hello chat, how is everybody? I see there has been Drusilla discussion in there. going to be enough cling film. Again, I'm using the awful cling film that I don't like because there's still, it still looks like there's a good couple of meters on it left on this roll, but I can't wait to finish this cling film because it's awful. Um, oh, now I have a dry throat. Please excuse me while I take a tea break. I'm drinking Sencha Goji Berry Green Tea today. Mmm, that's much better. Right, the blocking net. So I could steam it, but I could also just spray it with water and see how it goes. Uh, let me cut some off. There's so much of this that I guess I, I, I shouldn't worry too much about wasting it. Um, because otherwise I'll get too precious about it. Let me get my measuring tape. Uh, let's see how much I'm likely to need, just to give myself enough. Do you know what? I should just cut 50 centimetres. Just a square of 50 by 50 will probably be what I want. Let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's going to be a bit difficult. Um, so, um, hello, SW, SDW, um, thank you for joining. I'm glad you've managed to catch the live. And Shari says, maybe spray with water. I wonder if it might, uh, if it may melt being so fragile. Yes, that's kind of what I'm worried about. Steam wouldn't melt it. I mean, hopefully it wouldn't melt it. Um, but I think water is probably the way to go with this one. Right, let's get 50 centimeters. And also I kind of can't be bothered to get the steamer out, even though I've prepped it next to me, but I just, I'm, I, I am tired. Maybe I should have taken the day off, but I just, I, I miss chatting to all of you guys. <laughs> and I didn't want to leave you all without a video, so, um, because I hadn't prepped anything. And I'm not in frame at the moment, but um, just so that you know, I'm, I'm just cutting out 50 centimeters worth of fabric and trying to kind of be straight with my cutting line so that's why you're not seeing anything just because I want to get it really really straight I'm just really concentrating okay once I cut this off I'll show you guys exactly what's happened I really hope this works because I love making turbans so much and yes I made my own blocking net in one of the other videos and it is possible it's just so much extra work that suddenly the turbans just increase in price and then it feels like it's not worth selling them to people because then they're paying for extra you know extra time for me to make the actual stiff blocking net and that doesn't feel right to me from a consumer perspective so yeah if this works i'm going to be so happy because i do see summer as turban season they're very lovely to just throw on and leave the house if you've got like hair that you haven't washed <laughs> Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm just going to cut off the bit where I ripped it. So. And actually, we'll experiment with this bit that I've cut off. Before I cut off any more, let's just experiment and see what happens to this blocking net. That's a good idea. Okay. I wonder what the best angle to, f 
to show you guys this is uh, maybe let's go this view because you can see my um my crown block over here this is a standard crown block and it's actually um so if i make this turban foundation this would be a turban for me because it's an experiment um or a turban for my mum. in which case we both kind of have the same head size um hers is just like five millimeters larger than mine um but i have learnt since making a few turbans that i prefer my turbans to be slightly larger than my head size because i normally have poofy hair or i have a bun like this so i just need a bit of extra space in the turban foundation to accommodate for the extra poofiness of the hair or the bun so i've gone for a crown block that's one centimeter larger than my head size um I'm gonna spray this and see how it stretches. And I'm going to try and not spray my laptop with water as I do this. Oh, okay. If I'm really gentle with it, that worked really well. I'm quite pleased with that. Is it gonna stay in that? Oh, it's so sticky. Oh, that's so sticky. And it's leaving a bit of a yellow residue on my hands as well. That's a little weird. Maybe it's just because it's so old. That went really well. Okay, that's gonna work exceptionally great. Um, I guess I'm gonna test the next thing I've been meaning to test. A while ago, I went on a on a kind of eBay hat shopping spree for things. Um, actually, this one wasn't from eBay. Um, this is from um, another milliner, but I bought this. This is a vintage 1940s blocking spring. So you're supposed to pop it over the top of the block and not have to use pins. I've been a bit worried about using it because it's so stiff. I really have to, I mean, I've, you know, I've been doing push-ups and my arms are stronger than they've ever been, but this is still really, really, really difficult to kind of, um, pull apart and I know you can get modern blocking springs but I didn't really want to buy them because I don't tend to usually block hats that work well with blocking springs but I thought I'd try this one on this material and see if it rips with it because obviously this has got a texture and we know this is fragile and this is a test so I guess let's see I'm gonna have to stand up to do this so okay um, it has a bit of an orientation it's a bit of an oval uh, and the idea is is that the blocking spring is kind of sized to the size of the block and you are supposed to just pull it down Ooh. okay no that does work that works and then you're supposed to be able to pull your material and the blocking spring should hold it is that holding that feels like that's holding. Oh, that's working very well. This is much faster than using um, blocking pins. Oh, okay. There's a bit over here that's really, really wet and I just heard it rip. Okay, so we can't overspray this blocking net. Okay, no, that does seem to have worked. I have a few creases down the sides, but I think that's just because I've got this strip of a rectangle and if I covered the entire crown, that should work. Gosh, my hands are so sticky. Okay, I guess I'll take this off and we'll cut a square to size and we'll block that. Okay, one thing I have learned about the blocking springs, and this is really, really important. If you're using a blocking spring and you're gonna take it off the block, make sure you have full contact with the block with your thumbs like this because if that spring springs off the block and you've not got anything to stop it it's going to spring up in your face and you're going to really hurt yourself so there we go i kept my thumbs on and i rolled and it's come off quite well uh oh okay ah an issue an issue before we get too excited about the blocking net it's got itself caught in here maybe uh but this is the wet bit so the rest of it's already dry, but this is a very, very damp, saturated bit with water. So maybe that's why. And then if I try and pull it, oh, it's really, oh, it's kind of melted into itself. Okay, we'll be very careful, I guess. Oh, it didn't rip. I thought it ripped, but it didn't rip. Oh, that's encouraging. Oh, you can see it's got a little bit of a, 
a dome to it. Right. I'll get rid of this and cut out a 50 centimeter square, I think we said. Let's try. This bit feels particularly stiff. The stiffness in this net feels a bit kind of all over the place. There's this bit that feels really stiff and then a bit that I just picked up from the other end feels less stiff. Oh, definitely, yes. I wonder if that's um, anything to do with the way it might have been stored over the past however many years. Like maybe if it was in a bit of a damp environment. London's quite a damp city. So if it was kept in a damp environment, it might have lost a bit of its ability to be... Um, uh, stiff. I'm just going to measure 50 centimeters and to get a nice square, I'm just going to fold, or actually because it's already 50 centimeters, I don't need to measure it at all. I can just fold this corner over to get a straight guideline for my cut. There it is. Just hold that down with my arm. Have we got any photographers in the chat by any chance? I've had photography on my mind this whole week. Um, because I, I photograph all my own hats because I can't afford to employ a photographer. Um, and I've been learning my way around the camera. And this week, another thing I learnt in, uh, in my quest to better myself um, around technology, I've learnt how to shoot in raw camera files and edit them. So if, we, if we've got any photographers in the chat, <laughs> let me know what you think about shooting in RAW and how you edit your photos. Right, let's block. Because this is hexagonal, I'm kind of going to assume that it doesn't have any particular way it should go onto the block. Like, it, I, I don't think it matters what's the bias and what isn't the bias because it's a hexagonal weave anyway um so i'm just going to spray it oh that's going to saturate it i'm going to very lightly spray it away from the technology a few months ago i thought to myself oh i'll i'll just uh, my laptop needs a clean it was looking a bit grubby and i thought Oh, I'll, I'll just wash the keyboard. Um, and uh, I put too much water on it and the keyboard stopped working. So I'm now trying my best to not have any water anywhere near my laptop because once again, that's another lesson that I've learned. Okay, I've discovered something. If it um, isn't damp enough, I can hear it kind of rip apart as I pull. And I think that's the stiffening agent, starch or whatever it is, holding the fibers together and the fibers rip. But if I dampen it, it loses that crunching sound. So it becomes more pliable. So actually maybe saturating it in a lot of water is the way to go. Right, I'm going to pull it down. Oh, that ripped. That was definitely a rip. Oh dear. Oh no, I have ripped it in places. Okay, so how come, how come I managed to get this? Oh, let's, okay, I'm, I'm going to persevere and see what happens with this because I've already cut this bit off. I'm going to pull down the blocking spring. Oh, you see, that could have flung in my face. No, I think that's ripping it even more. So how come it worked with the small rectangle, but with the big rectangle it doesn't want to work? Let 
Maybe I was too rough with it. Oh gosh, it's so sticky. <gasps> Ripped it again. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to try and put the blocking spring on it again. It's got rips in it. I'm not going to be able to use it. Um, but it's not a lot of blocking net and I've, I've got to practice somehow. Okay, that's looking a bit better. Um, do you know what I think we'll do? I'll, I'll try and even this out from under the blocking spring and then we'll check back on it maybe in uh, an hour or so and see if it's dry. Oh, it's got so many folds in it. I've really not done this very well at all. Um, I'm not going to worry about the folds, I'm just going to let it stay here and dry and then take it off the block and at least see how stiff it is because if it's not stiff at all there's no point in using it as a turban foundation and I'll find another use for it and in fact I have a few ideas for other uses for this blocking net. Um, but. Uh, if, if it doesn't keep its shape like this, then um, there's no point in trying it again and wasting more fabric material. But if this dries and it does feel stiff enough, then if, if, if there's time before the end of the stream, I'll try again. And maybe I'll try blocking it with an elastic rather than the blocking spring. But on the plus side, I think I've got my head around how to use the blocking spring now, which I've been putting off for ages. Um, Shari says, could you use straps and bind them together? Would that be too tedious? Oh, no, not, not straps, strips. Um, yes, Shari, you could. But the problem with that is that you end up with joins on the inside of, um, the hat. And then I would have to line it. And one of the things I like very much about turbans is the blocking net in itself. I think is a really pretty fabric, a really pretty material. You can see the little diamond crosses on it. And I think it just looks really nice with a fabric behind it. So if I find some kind of fabric with my sticky fingers, something that's light and you can see through. Okay, some velvet. Um, so let's say I was doing a velvet turban. And so the velvet would cover the top of the blocking net. You see the inside of that? It looks really nice. It doesn't need a lining to hide any sins, as it were. So I would only put in a lining if I really, really had to because I hate linings. And incidentally, if you would like to learn how to do a lining, I have a video on um, a tip and sideband linings available to view through my Patreon. So if you would like to see how I make a tip and sideband, a tip and sideband lining, um, if you follow the link below in the description box to join my Patreon, you can see that video there. Um, but I really don't like linings, so I try and avoid them. Um, and if I join strips up together, then I would have to do a lining to cover it. And that's just extra steps to a turban. It adds to the end price of the turban because it will take me time and more materials to complete those steps. And I don't really want to pass those costs on to um, customers and clients if I don't have to, essentially. Because I think hats can be really expensive as they are. And if you wanted a super, super expensive hat, you can go to the high-end hat designers and um, buy one of their hats. And they will be impeccably finished and lined and just beautiful and everything. And I'm not saying that mine aren't. I think my hats are quite pretty because I wear them myself. Um, but I do like to, what's the phrase? I don't want to say I like to cut corners because I, th I think that sounds a bit too lazy, but I like to do, I like to do just enough work where the hat looks really good inside and out, but not overdo it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> what do you guys think? Um, do, when you guys make hats, do you like them to be like super, super high end couture on the outside and the inside and the final cost and the price and the time doesn't matter to you? Or do you guys prefer to kind of have a more whimsical approach and just do what's necessary? Um, or maybe you guys don't care about the insides at all because only you're going to see them. Um, let me know in the chat or in the comments. 
what you think. I, I'd love to know what you think, actually. I think that's a really interesting question for milliners. <laughs> and I would like to say there is no right or wrong way. Um, it's, um, it's whatever works for you. <laughs> okay, I think this is going to dry pretty fast, but we should move on and try um, a different thing. Now, I don't want to stay on the stream for too long, so I'm not, I don't think I have enough time to show you the cinema and the hat band ribbon. So let's do a poll and then I will put on my intermission music to go and wash my fingers to get all the stickiness off them. And um, you can tell me in the poll if you'd rather see invisible stitches on cinema or um, how to do a ribbon band. So let's see, create a poll. Last time I did this, I got this wrong. What would you like to see next? Uh, cinema. Cinema invisible stitches. Oh, if I could spell. There we go. No, that's not right. I'm wearing a plaster on my finger and I can type wearing a thimble, but for some reason I can't type wearing a plaster. It's just, it's very weird. But a thimble is fine. <laughs> Uh, so, Cinema Invisible Stitches or um, Peter Shum Ribbon. Okay, ask your community. So, there's a poll in the chat, hopefully appearing any second now. Hopefully it works. Did it appear? There it is. So uh, respond to the poll. I'm going to put on some intermission music while I go and wash my hands. everyone I'm back I have washed my hands um, my plaster is now all wet so that's annoying I really don't like having plasters on my fingers I can really feel them um, I already mentioned why I'm wearing the plaster <laughs> um, I had uh, one of my um, friends came over yesterday and I was helping her make a costume for a party that she's going to and um, the costume is essentially um, just lots of plaited ivy all over a foundation um, and we had a bit to drink and essentially maybe don't try and sew vines of leaves onto costumes 
when you've had a gin and tonic. Um, and if you guys want to see how we did that, I might post a video of it to my Instagram stories. So if you're, if you don't follow me on Instagram, go and find me at Bylona Millinery. And if you catch me in the next 24 hours, I will post that video of um, us having fun and making this costume to um, Instagram stories. <laughs> I think we had fun. <laughs> Let's have a look at the poll. Oh, where do I? look at this poll. Let's end poll. I think everyone has hopefully had a chance to vote. What did the poll results say? Where did it go? Aha. Uh -huh. um, Cinema Invisible Stitches, 62% and Peter Shum Ribbon Hatband, 37%. Interesting. I for some reason assumed everyone would go for the Ribbon Hatband. Um, but never mind, let's do cinema. Arguably more useful, um, but sorry husband, no hat yet. <laughs> right, let's get out what we need for the cinema. I have my bias brim. And I have some yellow threads. I need to pick a matching thread, I haven't figured out which one matches this yet. Um, and the aim is... Let me show you on the other camera. Maybe let's go a bit closer. Let's be here. There we go, and then you can see. I might need to zoom that in a bit closer later when we're stitching. The aim is to just stitch down this over here, this diagonal, um, well, this, this bias curve. And it's the same on the inside here. So I've got two rows of stitching to complete, and they need to be invisible on the inside and also on the outside, and that is possible to do. It's a little time consuming. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take me because I have timed myself before, but I don't have my timesheet in front of me, so I can't remember how long it should take me. Uh, but we need to find a matching ribbon that matches, uh, a matching thread, sorry, that matches close enough. Um, oh, uh, SDW says in the chat, agreed on the piece being well finished, but doesn't have to be excessively done. I love how the blush me black mesh looks with the velvet inside. It's like exposed beams in architecture, structural yet nice. Yes, I've never thought about it that way. What a lovely way to think about the insides of a hat. So poetic. That's really lovely. I'm always going to think of the inside of a hat like um, architectural beams now. That's a really good analogy. I love it. <laughs> right, back to the cinema. So I need to pick a thread and I don't have an exact match because this one, it's close enough, but you can see that it's a little on the light side. So you can see the light reflecting it there, or hopefully you can see. It might not translate on the video. This one is too orange. I don't even have to... Oh, no, let's grab a thread out because sometimes you could be surprised. Is it too orange? It is a bit too orange. I can definitely see that. Yes, I can see that. I don't know if the camera picks it up. Then I have this really, really light yellow. That's definitely going to be too light. Oh, that's definitely too light. It kind of looks like white against the yellow. So when you're matching thread to something... I've found that it's always best to pick, if, if you've got two options and one's lighter than your material and one is darker than your material, I found that it's better to pick the darker option because that's going to absorb the light and it's going to look, at least from a certain distance, more part of the hat and look more invisible. Whereas if you were to use the lighter thread, like if I was to use this one for example, it really reflects the light, so no matter how I look at it and how I um, rotate this hat, it's catching the light from everywhere. Uh, so I've got a window behind me, it's picking that light up, it's picking up my front light and my light that's kind of above me over here. Whereas the darker one is definitely picking up less light and so it disappears into the hat. Whereas the light one um, just jumps forwards at you. It's kind of the same principle with makeup. If you put like a light eyeshadow on, that part of your face jumps forward. And then if you put a dark eyeshadow on, it recesses. So it's the same with thread. So I'm 
definitely not going to use this light one. Uh, that's also way too light in, and it's also a bit green toned and this is a quite a warm yellow. So this is not a good, not a good option. And then I have this mustard. Oh, that's definitely going to be too dark. Oh, actually. You see, I say it's going to be too dark and then I take a thread off and I put it against the hat and actually that does disappear quite nicely, especially when I put it along um, the kind of grain of the cinema. But I think I'm possibly still going to go with this lighter yellow option, even though I did say it was... Um, oh, maybe I'm not. Hmm. Okay. Or, you know, the other option would have been to just go to a shop and pick the right yellow because thread comes in so many different colours. But I'd rather use what I have in my cupboard. So I'm going to pull on the thread a bit, make it tight and have a look at the corners and the edges and see what I can see. Oh, that light one is really standing out. Whereas the darker mustard coloured one is surprisingly just disappearing. Can you see over here? I don't think you can see the thread because I can hardly see it. Um, the mustard one, but the light one I think really stands out. Okay, we're using the really dark mustard one. So look at that. This is really dark and yet it matches this bright lemon yellow colour. Interesting. And when I store my thread, I like to roll it back up and just make sure the thread is caught on the spool, otherwise it goes everywhere. Like even on these old spools that don't have um, the ridge, I've cut in with a knife to give it that ridge so I can catch the thread. So the thread doesn't go everywhere. So also you can do that. You can also cut into plastic. Somewhere on this one I've cut into it as well and done the same thing. Right. I'm going to be reaching over and just checking how dry that blocking net is. Hopefully it will dry in the next half hour. So I'm going to need a needle. And hopefully not the plasters, but I do have them on hand. <laughs> uh, needle, scissors, I don't need pins because I've got clothes pegs holding the cinema together. Clothes pegs are really good for holding layers of cinema together. Surprisingly so. You're, ne you're never gonna get pins through it because they'll just break. And I've got some thimbles here that I will figure out which one I would prefer to use in a second. Yep, I think that's everything that I need. Uh, zoom in a bit more, I think. There we go. That should... Hopefully you guys can see that. Well, I say hopefully you guys can see it, but they're going to be invisible stitches, so hopefully you won't see anything. Um, so I tend to use milliner's needles for everything, even when I'm hand sewing um, dresses. Just, I like the feel of them. They're really, really sharp, so um, that's why plaster. Um, this is size 5, so that's the shorter ones, and size 10 are the longer ones. And I think just because of how my finger is, I'm going to possibly go with the longer needle today. Yes, I'm going to go with the size 10 needle, which is the longer one. It's a little bit thicker and it's a little bit longer. And it's just going to be easier for me to handle it while I'm wearing a thimble. Length of thread. So when cutting a length of thread, I like to pull it um, no larger, no longer than the span of my arm to kind of my bra strap. Because if it's any longer than that, it gets tangled. And then I'm going to thread the needle. <laughs> My friend was very impressed yesterday when I managed to thread the needle without any kind of needle threader. <laughs> Except today I'm going to struggle. Oh, no, I got it. I was, I was thinking I was about to struggle because the thread is the same colour as the plaster and I couldn't see it. <laughs> okay, and now to tie a knot. This is a really clever way of tying a knot. I'm going to show it to everyone because when I first started in millinery about five years ago and I went to my first millinery class, the tutor saw how I was um, tying a knot 
in the thread and um, told me, no, don't do it that way, do it this way. And this is a really clever way of doing it. So you take your thread and you wrap it around your index finger. Then you hold down that join, roll your fingers and then pull on that thread and just make sure you don't let go of it and you pull it and here it is. Here is that knot, nice and quick. So you don't sit there fiddling and manually tying knots. So, uh, I'm definitely going to need a thimble. This is very stiff cinema. You'll find that different um, brands of cinema, different suppliers of cinema, um, some of them will be stiffer and some of them will be um, a little bit more flimsy. And the stiffer one is definitely more difficult to sew just because you're not trying to pierce it. You're trying to weave it between the holes like you would on any kind of straw hat. But you're also going through so many layers because um, when I work with cinema, I don't tend to work with cinema, but I don't like how transparent it looks. Sometimes that's really lovely on hats, but that's just not for me. That's not my style. I like it to look like a solid colour from far away. So you can see on the uh, big camera view, on the front camera view, from far away, this looks quite solid. So you can kind of make out the background behind me, kind of. Like you can tell when I move it from the orange to the white, you can see that change. So if I hold it here, you can see half of it's in shadow and half of it isn't. Um, but this is one, two, three, this is four layers of cinema. And on the overlap, that makes it eight layers of cinema. So there's a lot to stitch through here. Okay, we've got our needle, we've got our knot. I should really wear a thimble because this is gonna hurt. In fact, I'm going to do two thimbles today and see how I feel halfway through because this does make it more difficult to pick up the needle. But I really hurt all my fingers yesterday, so I need to protect myself. First off, I need to place the knot somewhere where I can't see it. Now, because this is two layers being joined together, that's actually really easy because I can hide the knot between the two layers. So that's useful. So let's do that. Uh, let's find a place to pop it, pop it in. Uh, and then I'm also just pushing the layers together with my other hand just to make sure that they're nice and stiff. And this tail that I didn't quite manage to um, tuck in, I'm going to cut it off once I'm finished. So, popping the knot through into the top. Oh, there it is. Okay, the knot's gone in. I'm going to make sure I can't see it on either side. And then what I'm going to do is, <laughs> and I mean, it would probably have been easier to show you guys invisible stitches with like a black thread or something, because then you could see where the stitch is landing, but I really need to actually make this hat properly. So it's, it's not really a good demonstration sample, but so where the point of my needle is over here, this is where my thread is coming out. I am literally going to grab just one strand of the cinema, just one strand traveling upwards and push the needle through to the other side. And can you see how, if I focus that camera, the needle has gone through at an angle. So it's on a diagonal. It's not gone straight. It's gone on a diagonal. That's where we're hiding the stitches. So it's a bit like with felt, um, but you can't travel as far because it's just not quite possible. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Just pick up one strand of the cinema and really um, insert my needle in the direction of the seam that I'm trying to stitch together. There it goes. Can you see that? That is the angle. That's the angle at which I've gone. So I've not gone straight with the needle. It's on a diagonal. That's how it makes the stitches invisible. And the other th problem with sewing cinema is that it's straw and the thread catches on everything, especially if I'm moving it around so much. There it is, there it goes. Oh, the focus is all out on this, but we shall carry on. So now my thread is over here. I think the mustard was the best choice for this, the thread 
color of the thread. And here it is again on the diagonal. Oh, you see on this side, I'm not quite picking up enough of the brim. So I'm going to move it over a bit and angle it slightly differently. There it is. And the idea here, this isn't really a structural stitch. It's kind of a tacking stitch. It's holding things in place. So I want it to, I don't want there to be too many stitches. I want there to be just enough stitches. So I'm really going to try and travel as far as I can, which involves really sticking the needle in diagonally. There it goes. And then the thread gets caught. So it's invisible on the underside and it's invisible on the top side. So let's go again. The other good way of hiding the stitches is to make sure that your stitch direction, so even though you're catching one strand of cinema, um, you want those stitches to be going with the direction of this kind of circular weave. So I'm going to make sure that I'm catching a stitch either right next to it in one direction or in the other direction. So I'm not going to go diagonally across the weave. I'm going to follow it. And again, this, the thread gets caught on the cinema. And one thing I could potentially do is wax the thread. I, I don't tend to wax thread when sewing with anything that's not felt, but maybe that could straighten out my thread a bit, make it a bit stronger. That's something to try next time. I'm just bringing it close to my face here just so I can see what I'm doing because they really are invisible. Yeah. I think if I'd used the lighter thread, I would have been able to see the stitches, but this is actually pretty good. I guess I'll just keep going. <laughs> Chat amongst yourselves. I don't know how long this is gonna take me. I've done about five centimeters so far. So here it is coming up at an angle. Oh, I think my music has stopped playing. Let me just remedy that. Yes, it did, and no one, no one said anything. <laughs> there we go. Maybe the music was too quiet. Again, going in at a diagonal. And up we go. Does any of this make sense? Tell me in the chat if any of this made any sense. <laughs> and as I said earlier, this style of hat, this kind of brim, the technique of um, the cinema bias brim, I have made a video on it. I just need to edit it and then I will publish it. But because this is such a summary hat, I'm thinking that that will come not anytime soon, but kind of maybe after May. Um, SDW says, um, asks beeswax. I'm, I'm guessing what you mean by that is um, if I wax the thread, do I use beeswax? Yes, the answer is yes. And um, I'm sure I've shown how to wax thread in several other videos uh, so any video where I'm working with felt you'll probably see how I wax thread and here's here's another thing about this the stitching line here will that focus will that focus no there we go the stitching line here this is where my needle's sticking out that's about a centimeter and a half away from the edge I could have done it on the edge, but that would require so much more accuracy. And as this is just a tacking stitch, it doesn't really matter. Oh, 
tops. <sighs> this thimble, sometimes it's too small for me, sometimes it's too big for me. It really only fits me perfectly when I have completely no nail on, on my thimble finger over here. Um, Oh, Sherry says, I don't hear any music. There is a sort of blowing sound in the background, almost like a, uh, like a rain or ocean waves. Oh, I'm very sorry about that. I don't know what that could be. Um, okay, there's definitely music playing now. Well, um, it could be, Shari, that you're hearing the trains behind me because I essentially live above a train station because this is London and uh, <laughs> there is no more land. So the only way they're building new houses or new flats, I live in a flat, is uh, to build them above train station lines. So it could be that you're hearing the trains passing behind me because I can certainly hear them. And I do get very paranoid. I'm going to take the um, clothes peg off now because it's, it's holding itself. I do get very paranoid that you can really hear them on my videos. Um, I, I hope I managed to edit them out enough. Is, um, I know I'm right, um, right now I'm kind of into photography and visual language in the videos, but a couple of months ago I went through a phase where I was getting really passionate about learning about um, microphones and sound systems and audio editing. And that's when I started getting really paranoid about can you guys hear the trains in the background of my video. <sighs> so I want everything to be really professional and really crisp. And I'm certainly no professional at videography <laughs> but i'm trying my best <laughs> there we go i've almost finished so actually that didn't take too long for some reason i thought this was going to take me so much longer i'm coming up to the join in a second do you know you could also be hearing my laptop fans whirring we were just discussing with my husband before the stream whether it's worth to um, whether it's worth getting me a new machine because my current one is um, getting on in years and it has been dying on me and we just did a Windows reinstall uh, this week to see if that would help it but we have been debating whether to get me a new laptop or not I don't know I'm not yet convinced I don't like spending money. I'm very frugal. <laughs> so you could be hearing my laptop whirring because I can certainly hear it. And the microphone's right next to it. Um, Sherry says, it's probably something on my end that's referring to the, the, the ocean waves sound. I have both my TV and my phone on the stream so I can chat and watch with my mum. Oh, that's really nice. Hello, um, Shari and Shari's mum. Thank you for joining me today. And thank you to everyone else for joining me as well. I do always find the streams so much fun. Hence why I was supposed to take a day off and I couldn't. <laughs> I needed to uh, unwind a bit on the stream and do something useful, which this is useful. It, it really needs to just get done because I need to photograph it. I know, and I, I know it looks like I'm holding this hat in a very weird way, but actually this is a very useful way to hold things because I've got my thumb on the underside of the brim and I've got my other two fingers holding it and then I have a space to put the needle in through and I'm not going to stab myself. Okay, I've reached to the kind of lip over here. I don't know if that's still focused. Let's just refocus. I've reached the lip over here, so I'm almost at the end of where I want to stitch. One thing I'm noticing is that... Oh, that really didn't focus. One thing I'm really noticing is that there's a um, quite a severe gap over here. You can really see through the brims, and that's what I don't want to happen. So I'm going to have to double back on myself um, and stitch those bits down a bit better. So I'm just going to finish doing the edge. And catch everything down. Okay. 
Okay, I'm happy with that join. I'm going to make my way across now. Um, is that where I started? No. Oh, that's the other side of the hat. Oh, that's why I'm seeing a, a gap there, because I haven't stitched this side yet. Okay, I'm going to check the other inside bit. Yes, that all looks pretty good to me. So, yes, I can make my way across and then go down the bit I haven't stitched yet, which is why it's sticking up. <laughs> which way am I going? I'm going across. could do with a, a few more extra stitches. Sometimes this many layers of cinema can bend needles. So right now I'm stitching through, there's a bias binding on this. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Right now I'm stitching through 12 layers of cinema. So that can really bend needles. But so far, see, it seems to be going very well. And now that I've said that, something will inevitably go wrong. The worst thing is if the thread was to break at this point, because it's not secured anywhere. So maybe I should tie a knot in it just to secure it on the underside. Let me just get it to the underside and we can tie a knot. Okay, yes, I'm going to tie a knot just to make sure everything stays. Let me show you how to tie a knot. So I'm going to put in a loop into here and I'm not going to pull the needle through all the way. I'm going to catch a, sti catch a strand of cinema, poke the needle back through and I've made a loop on this side of the hat. So. Here it is. I've, I've caught it on my finger. You can see it on my middle finger there. There's a loop of thread and this is my needle. And I'm going to catch the needle and loop it around my thread three times. So one, two, three. And then I'm going to pull the needle through and hope that that knot ends up at the bottom. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of hand holding that thread and trust it to go wrong live on stream which it probably will because I can't see what I'm doing I'm just going to try and see what I'm doing did it knot itself too high up oh no there we go that should work okay I'm just making sure it works its way down okay I'm going to take the needle off so that I don't stab myself as I pull on that thread there we go I've tied the knot normally it's doesn't it's it normally it's not this complicated something happened there with the thread i think it was getting tangled on the cinema let's re-thread that i'm not going to cut the thread off because that was just a a kind of securing knot just in case i break this length of thread i'm just going to check if this is dry it's slightly damp and sticky, but maybe we can take it off and see once I finish this row of stitches. That, I'm talking about the blocking net that we did earlier. Uh, right, so going towards this clothes peg. Let me just double check that it's nice and flat together. And then I'll go down with some stitches, invisible stitches, towards the clothes peg. So same as before. Oh, that's not getting all the layers. There it is. There it goes. And traveling in a diagonal motion. Catching a single strand of cinema coming back up. These bits around the um, 
lip over here folded over those are the most difficult bits because you can't you don't quite have the same control of the needle as you do going on this side so in this side i can really direct it in a diagonal way but then on the other side you see it's it, it comes out and then to put it back it back through there's not quite enough space inside the hat for my hand so i just have to put it through and prioritize making it invisible rather than directional whoops I just pulled the thread out of the needle eye. So I'm going to try and thread it while the needle is still half stuck in the uh, in the hat. This happens to me a lot. I think it's the thimbles that I use because I like to use these homemade leather thimbles because as you saw earlier, the metal ones just fly off my fingers because I've got long nails and I'm not sacrificing my long nails. I like my long nails. I was given a choice when I was younger by my piano teacher. She said, you either need to chop your nails or you need to stop playing the piano. And I said, oh, well, that's easy. I'll stop playing the piano. Then I'll just grow my nails. <laughs> and I feel the same about millinery. Nothing is going to make me chop my long nails off unless I break one. And so... I'd rather use a homemade leather thimble than a metal one until I can find an open top metal thimble, which I would like to in my size. The open top uh, metal thimbles, they're called tailoring thimbles. Um, but because tailoring has always been, had always been traditionally a male profession, it's very difficult to find small sized, um, oh dear, I've, caught my thread on a bit of cinema and now it's looped okay let's see all that okay no that's fine that's fine I managed to pull it through um, so yeah tailoring has always traditionally unfortunately been a um, a male profession and so the thimbles so normally I would resort to buying Victorian sewing thimbles um, but there just don't seem to be that many around in tiny sizes for tailors but there's a lot of tiny sized victorian like ladies sewing thimbles with the closed ends All right taking that clothes peg off although mm, no i want to keep the clothes peg on but this is this brim is slightly coming apart over here you can see the shadow so i'm just going to really push that together and pop the clothes peg on i might pop the two on just to make sure it's all holding steady Sherry says, haha, problem solved, nails before piano. Exactly, exactly. So, I have a piano, it's next to me over here. Do I play it? Nope. <laughs> I have a friend who's a um, concert pianist though, so when he comes around, he plays the piano and it's very nice. <laughs> That's kind of the only reason why it's hanging around. But I, I refuse to get rid of that piano. Um, to my husband's great despair He thinks it just takes up space, but I'm rather attached to that piano even though I don't play it I could play it I can play some Christmas carols um, Silent Night is a particular favorite of mine and I can also play um, a Mozart sonata and I can play um, What's the one that everyone can play? The Beethoven um, for release, I can play. And when I say I can play, I can, I can press the keys and achieve the notes, but not necessarily in the right order to the correct timing. My mum can play the piano, she's rather good. She can play um, like some Scott Joplin and some really fun stuff like that. That's, that's a lot of fun. And my sister can play the piano. My sister's very musical. Um, she plays the clarinet and um, the harp. Um, and I think she plays the recorder. And what, when I say my sister plays the recorder, I mean like professionally, like not like a child playing a recorder. Like she properly plays the recorder. It's really good. Um, what else does she play? The guitar. Yeah, she's very musical. And I'm just into my pretty fashion things, so, um... 
not as cultured as my sister. I'll just stick to computers and hats and nails. Oh, okay, I've lost the thread again. That's because it's getting a bit short and I don't want to risk getting to the end of the stitching line and not having enough thread left to tie a good knot. So I'm going to tie a knot now by re-threading the needle. This is where it gets a bit complicated because I've got to try and position that knot inside the two layers of cinnamon. So I'm going to poke it through. Um, but I'm going to only poke it through in between the layers. So I'm going to just peel away one layer like this. Let's refocus that camera. There it is. Uh, I'm going to take the thimble off for this one just to have a bit more control. I'm going to pull that through and that closes the two layers. Um, and then I'm going to poke it back through the other side and create a loop. Hopefully there's enough thread for this. Is there enough thread? I've got to keep hold of that loop end. It's not easy with a plaster on. Um, no, this isn't going to work. Okay, I'm just going to show a knot on the inside. I could hide the knot, but I don't think I'm as fussy as the Victorians. So it's going to be a tiny knot. Only I will know it's there. No one will see it on the underside, I hope. I'd rather have my cinema closed really tightly than sacrifice function to hide a knot. So I've got a loop there. Uh, I'm going to... I appreciate this isn't the easiest thing to see. There it is. I'm going to loop it one, two, three times round. Pull that through. Make sure that thread is pulled really tightly and everything's closed up and I'm going to start pulling. There it is, really tight. That looks pretty tight. Oh, there's a bit, there's a tiny gap. Tiny gap, oh, I could have done that better. Oh well. At least you definitely can't see the knot there on the, on the outside yet. I just struggled to find it there when I looked. So the knot is where my thumbnail is. Oh, whoopsie, the camera. I will just change the battery. Bear with me. Hopefully that's worked. Yes. Now I've just got to refocus again. There we go. So I hope you guys are learning things with this. I, I feel like um, sometimes when I explain things, and my husband will agree with me here, um, I feel like sometimes I make things look a bit more complicated than they actually are because I'm really going into a lot of detail about things. Um, so I, I don't want to put anyone off trying this by making it look like it's this complicated, because it's not. Essentially, you're just doing a tacking stitch on one side, inserting your needle diagonally, and then doing a tacking stitch on the other side, on the underside. So tacking stitch, diagonal needle insertion, tacking stitch, diagonal needle insertion. That's all it is, um, but I'm obviously breaking it down a lot um, just to take my time over it, make sure that I'm expressing myself correctly and that you guys have understood me, hopefully. Right. And now I've lost where we stopped off. <laughs> but now that I'm seeing a little bit of lifting, oh, switch the camera views. Now that I'm seeing a little, still a little bit of lifting here, you can see where the shadow's falling. So over here, that's a really good join. Over here, I haven't done yet. You can see that flaps up and down. That join isn't done. This bit's a good join. This bit, you can see that black shadow there. That shouldn't be there. So when I thread up a new needle, I think I'm going to maybe just go over my stitches 
This top bit I can't really do anything about. Um, only steam will solve this, which I might do later. Um, but this should be pressed down a bit closer to the edge. So I can do that with my next pass of stitches. Um, but actually, I'm not going to continue with this because I've shown you the general gist. Uh, I'm just looking at the time because I don't want to overdo the stream because I do need a rest. So we've got half an hour left. Let's go back to the blocking net and see how that's doing. So let me just tidy away. But there we go. Cinemain invisible stitches. Hopefully that's all um, nice and clear. Shari says, I like your technical breakdown of every aspect. For me, the more information given, the more I can understand what I'm trying to achieve or the next steps should I make a mistake. That's so great to hear. Thank you, Shari. I appreciate everyone's feedback. If, um, like if you need me to slow down, I can slow down. If you'd like me to speed up, then I can try and speed up, but I don't guarantee it because I like to take my time. <laughs> Um, let's get to the blocking net. Oh, I think that's definitely dry enough. Here it is. Let's zoom out. Oh, zoom into over here and focus. You can see my dinosaur laptop here in the corner that's making the whirring noises. How does that feel? Um, yes, that feels dry to me. So it's still a bit sticky because well, when I felt the normal roll that's just lying behind me, that was also a bit sticky, but it doesn't feel cold to the touch. So a good way to know, to, to, a good kind of indicator of if something is dry or not is if you put your cheek to it, like this. If it feels room temperature, then it's probably dry. If it feels cold, then it's still damp. And your cheek is a really good indicator of that. Your cheek, or maybe like the, um, the inside of your elbow, that that's also quite a sensitive bit of skin, but cheek and elbow, so um, you decide. Cheek or elbow? <laughs> Let's take the blocking spring off. So I'm going to have to lean on it with my stomach a bit and make sure that I'm holding my thumbs here and let's hope that it doesn't take any of the net with it. Oh no, that seems to, oh, there we go, it's come off, spring. That looks actually pretty good. So I guess I'm going to try and block another one and then see how how that's um, gone. I kind of want to cut this to size though, just so that I'm not wasting anything. So I'm going to use a pencil. I'm going to take it off my spinner. So this is a crown block. It rests on a spinner. A spinner isn't quite the same as a stand. A spinner is like this short squat stand. And this is the crown block. I'm just going to mark on my front and back. So there's a mark here that I'm going to follow in the block. And obviously it's not going to mark on this, is it? So I need to put some pins in. <laughs> if this was buckram, the pencil would have shown up. In fact, even on the, um, on the modern blocking net, the pencil marks show up if it's white. But um, because it's this, I'm going to have to use... Whoops. Hold the block. I'm going to use some glass head pins. Um, usually, I tend to use dressmaking pins for everything, um, in case you don't know the difference. These are dressmaking pins. They don't have anything on the end of them, they're just plain metal. And then these are glass head pins. They have a bit of glass on the end. You can get these with a plastic tip as well, but the glass is better because it doesn't melt under your iron. Um, and the reason I'm using the glass head pins is because this is so fine, I want to make sure that I know where my pin is and I don't lose it. So I'm just going to weave it in and out of one mark to know where that is. And let's have a look at the other side. This is where the front is. On my block it's marked. The previous owner has marked that this is the front, so I'm just going off that. But of course, if you're using a block where it's not marked, you get to decide where you want the front to be. So I'm actually going to pop it up here. And I'm trying to not uh, get any cling film in there so that I can reuse the cling film. Because I'd rather not have to use cling film from the roll again and again. So uh, how am I going to remember what the front is? I'm going to put a crosswise pin into the back. 
So I'm going to know that the back is over here. And what I'll probably do is... Um, oh, trying to not catch the cling film. In fact, I think what I might do is just pop it back on the stand. And normally I would attach measurements to this, but I can't be bothered. So I'm just going to ouch, stab myself with a pin. I'm fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm going to pop on a rubber band and just cut. Although, actually the spring has left quite a good cutting line. I can see, you can see where the spring was, where the uh, blocking net is kind of going upwards. I'm actually just going to cut along that line and then I don't have to worry about drawing things on. Oh, I might have to take it off with the cling film. Let's see. Oh, oh I caught the cling film with the pin. Exactly what I didn't want to do. Oh, maybe I didn't. Okay, no, that's fine. I'm going to put the cling film back on the block. Um, if I was blocking felt and I had like a black felt and next I wanted to block a white felt, I would change the cling film. But because this is the same material in the same colour, I'm not worried about dyes seeping over or anything like that. So that's worked. Okay. Um, stiffness wise, it's about the same stiffness as my... Um... Okay, I'm not going to cut it yet. I'm going to leave it like this. It's about the same stiffness as my blocking net experiment from my starching. Um, it, behind me, I can't reach it at the moment, but it's over there. So I would put it on my head, but oh, I don't want to mess up my hair. I'll cut off a bit of it so that we can just look at it without it getting caught on everything. Maybe this is one of those cases where like two layers of the blocking net might be a good idea, a bit like cinema is one layer of cinema is very flimsy, but as soon as you start building up the layers, it becomes really strong. Maybe this is a similar principle. And then it doesn't, and then I would say it doesn't matter if there's a hole in it, but you can see it there. Hmm. I don't think that would support a bit of fabric. Let's drape some velvet over it and see if it can take the weight. So velvet's quite a heavy fabric because you've got a nap to it. So you've got the little loops that form the nice velvety soft side. And then you've got the backing fabric that holds the loops. It's a bit like a carpet. Let's see. Oh, surprisingly that does hold it. I was kind of expecting it to just completely crumple and it's fine. Hmm. I mean, it, it dents, but it does come back. I mean, this bit hasn't come back, but... That's not too bad. Okay, I will get my other experiment. And let's test the differences. And normally when I make a turban, it takes about a whole meter of silk dupion, which is quite heavy. But maybe it will hold. Okay, let's test. Oh no, my version is a lot flimsier. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if, on top of my starching method, I painted it with some chemical stiffener. I wonder if that would achieve this kind of stiffness, because this feels very sticky, and my, my immediate thought is, if it's sticky, it's got to be starch. That's kind of what I'm thinking. But at the same time, the stickiness has this kind of plasticky feel to it. So maybe it is a chemical stiffener. I don't know, but I'm surprisingly impressed with this. Um, so we see if it can, how much it can hold. I've got loads of velvet in the cupboard next to me. So let's try this whole bit of velvet. Oh no, and you see now that crumples. Okay, we, we, we have to do it scientifically and go a little bit at a time. So, if I unravel this, 
Okay, one layer of velvet. We know that works. I shall fold it in half and it becomes two layers of velvet. So this whole piece of velvet is, I mean, I've cut into it. This is the velvet that I used in the blue flower from a few streams ago. Um, this velvet is 50 centimeters by, I think 112 centimeters. So I've cut it in half, uh, folded it in half and let's test the folded in half. So that's two layers of velvet. Oh, okay. It's buckled under two layers of velvet. But Silk Dupion is much lighter than velvet, so maybe a pin tuck turban... Oh no, I don't... I was hoping I had some Silk Dupion behind me over here, but I don't. It's all somewhere else in another box, so I can't test that. But I actually think that's been quite successful. Right. Well, it's been almost two hours and my front camera is about to go so i don't know if i can say goodbye before the camera cuts out um husband maybe you could just come and change the camera view for me the battery on the front camera for me so that i don't have to rush too much um i guess while my husband's doing that before we wrap up um i can tell you what the next step will be for this if i was to make this into a turban um, I would want to bind the edge, so you can see on these ones, the edge is bound, and on this one as well. Now, this is a very thin binding, this is about, uh, it's about 8 millimeters, so less than a centimeter. And this one is, um, about a centimeter and a half. This is much more comfortable. In fact, I might even want to try going, um, making a band around it as much as 2 centimeters wide because that's really going to give it some extra structural integrity around the head size. So I think on this one, just because it's so thick, uh, so kind of flimsy, I might even try and do a three centimeter um, edge bind. Hmm. So that, that'll be what I do next. Um, I would be worried about doing it out of this fabric though, because it, it really does feel like it rips unless it's wet. Oh, the white balance has completely gone on the uh, front camera, but never mind. I think that speaks to um, the sun going to bed outside, and I think I need to go and take a rest too, um, because I was supposed to have a day off today, but uh, never mind. So, um, what have we done today? We blocked with some vintage blocking net, we've done some invisible stitching, and um, that's it. It's been a very casual stream. Um, we've had some lovely chats, and uh, thank you for joining in everyone, I always appreciate all your comments. And if you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing, if you're not already, it really helps me grow and reach a larger audience. And if you're watching this on playback, please leave me a comment, I'd like to know what you thought about any part of the stream today. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Bialona Millinery and you can also support me on Patreon and on Ko-fi and I really appreciate all your donations, all your tips and all your support, be that financial or um, just through your messages, I like hearing from you guys. Um, thank you so much for joining me, it's been a wonderfully pleasant one hour and 50 minutes and see you next time in the next video. Bye.